This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to our high Sunday service. This is the day that we think about Christ's victorious entry into Jerusalem. So I hope you're all feeling the joys of spring. And uh, as Alan says, we, you're not missing that hour that we lost overnight too much. So a few items for your diary this week. This Thursday, the 1st of April, sees the last of our current community Bible experience using our school. That's, uh, we've been walking through the books of Luke and of Acts, and we are on the last stage of that. So we're going to celebrate that by having a Zoom party. So come along, as usual, with your questions, any revelations you feel you've had over the week, and bring cake. So you can't have a party without cake. So we're going to be doing that on Thursday, our usual Bible study, but we're going to make it a little party. And then on Friday, the 2nd of April, as you know, that's Good Friday, where we want to commemorate the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus on that cross. It's a party of a different kind, but a celebration nonetheless, and we plan to have a communion service by Zoom at 7.30, that's on Friday evening. For that, you'll need to be prepared with um, some wine or juice, with bread or a cracker, just whatever you feel comfortable with. And um, we'll, have, we'll celebrate our communion service on Friday night. And of course, just as we have Good Friday to think of Jesus' death, we have Easter Sunday to celebrate his resurrection from the dead and from the grave and to praise God that we have a risen saviour. So next Sunday morning, we plan to open the church and have a service in the building. So if you'd like to come along to this, remember that you would need to book in through Church Suite. If you don't have access to Church Suite, then you can give Stuart, Diane a call and they'll book you into that. We can only have 30 in the church building at any one time. So um, as soon as it, keep an eye on church suite and as soon as it becomes available, book in to that. Um, just in case you can't get a place, in case there's a, a rush of people wanting to be there. Um, or if you would prefer not to join in the building, then you'll still be able to join the service by Zoom, just as we're doing today. Um, but you will see um, the service taking place within the church and the recording for that will be on YouTube uh, later on, just as usual. Now, although today we're all separated by distance in our homes, just as they were in the book of Acts, we know that the Lord is here among us because he said he would be and distance is no barrier for him. To help us to forget all that's happened in this previous week, our worries and anxieties, we're going to start our service with a video to help us to just quieten our hearts and minds, to enable us to be aware of God's presence and to be able to receive the blessing that he has for us today.
let's us pray together. Lord, with joy we greet your coming today. We lay before you our love and faith, rejoicing that you came in peace to be our King. Come, Lord, and teach us the ways of peace, that we may know the strength of love and the power of forgiveness. Come, Lord, and teach us humble ways, that we may be free of arrogance and without pretense. Let our songs fill this place with hosannas, for now the day of our redemption draws near. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, to whose kingdom there is no end. Amen. We're going to join in with those who sang in Jerusalem uh, that first Palm Sunday, a hymn that sings Hosanna, praise is rising, and feel free to disturb your neighbours by singing out loud, but on mute for Zoom. Thank you. 
your presence All our fears are washed away Washed away This is Palm Sunday, the Sunday when we remember those crowds in Jerusalem crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And today we're going to hear that story in two or three different ways. First of all, we're going to see a cartoon story um, of that. And then Oliver, our most faithful young person in turning up to church every week, is going to read with his mum. Uh, the story of Palm Sunday for us from Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. But first, let's watch our cartoon video together. The story of Easter, the triumphal entry. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love and healed people from their sickness. He did many miracles like calming storms and even raised people from the dead. At this time, the Jewish people were celebrating a festival called Passover that had been celebrated since the time of Moses when God brought his people out of Egypt. So Jesus was going to Jerusalem to celebrate. Jesus and his disciples stopped in the town. You're coming? And Jesus told two of his disciples to go on ahead of them. Eh, okay. He told them to go into a village and that they would see a young donkey that no one had ever ridden. Rock! He told them to untie it and bring it to him. If anyone asks, what are you doing? He told them to just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. Yeah, okay, go ahead. So the disciples did what Jesus said and brought him the donkey. A long time ago, before Jesus was even born, God had said that the Savior, the King of Israel, would come to Israel in this way. And now Jesus was doing just as God had said. The news that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem swept through the city. Many heard about all the amazing things he had done, so they cut palm branches and ran to see him. Huh? The Pharisees and religious rulers realized that there was nothing they could do, for everyone was going to see Jesus. Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem, and the crowd spread their coats on the road ahead of him. His followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. The Pharisees were upset. Hey, Jesus! 
and they told Jesus to stop the people from saying things like that. But Jesus said, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. So the people kept on singing, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered, asking, Who is this? And the crowds replied, It's Jesus. And Jesus rode the donkey through the street of Jerusalem to the temple in a triumphal entry, just as God said he would many years before. I'm reading from Luke chapter 19, verses 29 to 48. As he came to the towns of Beth Page and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garment over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, as he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started in the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd have said, Teacher, rebuke your followers from saying things like that. He, he replied, If they keep quiet, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and, and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How, how I wish today that all of you people would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not accept your opportunity for salvation. Then Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people selling animals for sacrifices. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. After that, he taught daily in the temple, but the leading priests, the teachers of religious law and other leaders of the people began planning how to kill him. But they could think of nothing because all the people hung on every word he said. Thank you, Oliver. That was absolutely fantastic. You you got a great microphone there and a great voice. Thank you very much for reading that story to us. I loved your smile when Jesus started to clear the temple and cause a bit of mischief there. I think you quite like that bit of the story. So we're now going to turn to pray, praying for our world and praying for those amongst us who need that prayer. And Jamie's going to lead us in prayer today. Thanks, Jamie. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us today in Palm Sunday online from our homes. We ask you to hear our prayers today for the church, the world, local communities, and the people in need. We pray for our Benny Baptist Church as we are in a different transition. We ask you to pour our Holy Spirit on the entire congregation, no matter where they are at this moment, so that we can show your love for one another and the local communities. We ask you to show each other that to play our part that you want us to play in our journeys with Jesus. We want to pray for your world, God, the nations where 
there are conflicts and hate crimes, whether it's caused by COVID pandemic, lockdowns, or any other reasons. And for the people in Myanmar, scared by the military coup, you will guide them, also us, to work for peace and the well-being for all people. And as we are one nation battling against COVID-19, we ask for the spirit of cooperation to roll out vaccines from all governments and all health centers, that we will also help those countries who do not have the financial abilities to buy the facilities to protect their people. You are the God of mercy and love. Let the rich serve the poor in your world. And we know there are so many people struggling because of illness. They're out of job. They're facing financial problems. They're isolated or they're feeling lonely. And those ones who, love, who lost their loved ones at this time. Some of them, we may not know them by name, but God, you know them all because you create single one of us. We ask you, dear Father, to draw close to those people in particularly so that they may be aware of your healing presence. And then we ask you provide your peace, strength, and comfort for them at this time. And lastly, I also want to pray those people who are watching on demand on YouTube, who cannot join us live. And to let you know that we love you as a church, Jesus loves you and God loves you. Dear gracious God, once again, we thank you for bringing us today on Life From Home. We thank you for being our inspiration and the focus of our praise, that you send us love, joy, and hope. And God, let us hear your voice through Alan's sermon in a minute. And let us be enthusiastic and humble like Jesus to those people that we are about to meet and may others be drawn to you in the Holy Week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you, Jamie, for leading us in prayer. We are going to be listening in and watching a poem as an introduction uh, to the sermon today. It's coming to you by a, a video. Uh, and it's a poem that unpacks this theme that we've been looking at all through Lent of journey and of walking with Christ as we begin to turn our minds to this final journey into Jerusalem. Church, this morning we want to invite you to take a walk with Jesus. From the beginning since Genesis, God has had a thing for walking in the midst of us. In Genesis 3, after God formed man like a potter forms clay, we find him walking in the garden in the cool of the day. In fact, throughout Scripture, if a man was close to God or considered God's friend, a writer would often use the phrase, this man walked with him. In a spiritual sense, the most important part of walking is knowing who you're walking with. Think of Genesis 5, full of men who lived and had some kids, then lived some more, and then they died. Until verse 21, when a man named Enoch lived and had some kids and walked with the Lord his God. See, Enoch was different. He wasn't like the rest. He understood walking with God meant the last word is never death. But that's the challenge, isn't it? Walking forward in his promises and trusting they're not counterfeit. That's why Palm Sunday is so significant. Jesus spent his life walking up and down mountainsides, turning fishermen into fishers of men, giving sight to the blind and making the lame walk again. He walked toward the diseased and across stormy seas to set people free from the demons that were seizing them. He walked through crowds, one moment eager to enthrone him, the next desperate to stone him. He walked along lakes and stayed up late, withdrawing to solitary, lonely places to pray. He walked in compassion toward the cry of the poor in spirit and in zeal against those too busy, too proud, or too afraid to hear it. He walked without a Fitbit, for he knew and he taught that walking with God isn't about the number of steps or the miles, but walking through life with the heart of a child, even through trials, especially through trials. According to Jesus, that's what makes the walk worthwhile. 
In Matthew 16, Jesus began to explain, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and die, but on the third day be raised to life. In fact, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Talk about faith. In fact, faith is the heartbeat of Palm Sunday because it takes faith to make a triumphal entry, knowing by Friday your cup will be empty. See, Jesus could walk through Sunday's gates knowing Good Friday's death was coming in faith that the joy set before him would overcome it Easter morning. How did he do it? we do it? Well, the most important part of walking is knowing who you're walking with. And Jesus knew the word of Isaiah 43. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you walk through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they won't overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame it shall not consume you. For I am Yahweh, your God. Fear not, I am with you. Church, this morning, Jesus invites you to take a walk with the only God worth walking with. He's the only God that calls us to lay down our lives as he laid down his and the only God with the power to raise us all again. Well, good morning. And uh, as Diane said before we started recording this service, it's pretty difficult to wait patiently for this lockdown to end. She didn't know what the first line of my sermon was, and it's this. How are you at waiting? Now, I've not found many people who are exactly good at waiting, who enjoy the experience of waiting. Whether it's waiting to hear exam results or waiting for results and tests from the doctor or waiting for your teenage child to return the car that was due back half an hour ago or waiting for the next holiday to arrive. Most of us wait impatiently, especially just now, waiting impatiently for normality to arrive. Maybe waiting for a haircut, waiting for the opportunity to do something that we haven't been able to do since Christmas. I've been waiting for my blue envelope had I lived in Fourth Valley, my blue envelope would have arrived by now and I would have had my jab. But I live in Eastern Bartonshire and they're not quite as organised as Fourth Valley at the moment. And so I'm still waiting for that blue envelope to tell me when I can go and get my injection and, and, and things can start to get back to normal. Still waiting. And waiting isn't easy. Every morning when I see the postman come, I nip out to the post box and open it up to see if the blue envelope's in there. But every morning so far, I've been disappointed. And maybe it's because I have such high expectations that it will arrive and that when it arrives that the vaccine will be effective. And then if the vaccine's effective, then we can get back to normal. There's so much riding on that envelope arriving. And so it is with Jesus' followers on Palm Sunday. The expectations were high. Anticipation had been building as they walked towards Jerusalem. They had walked to the home of Mary and Martha. They had seen the resurrection from the dead. They had walked along shorelines. They had seen people being healed. They had come to the home of Zacchaeus. They had seen a life transformed from this greedy little man to one who was being generous. And now, now they're walking to Jerusalem. 
Now they're walking with great expectations. The waiting was over. Jesus was about to become king. In John's gospel, the crowd proclaim him the king of Israel as he arrives at the gates of Jerusalem. In all the gospels, they cry out this word, Hosanna. If we were to put that into our modern language of a crowd at a demonstration or something, it would be like this. What do we want? Salvation. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Salvation. When do we want it? Now. That was the cry of Hosanna. That's what it meant. And the crowd grabbed their palm branches and they begin to wave them backwards and forwards. To be honest, that was a symbol almost like an SNP rally where they're waving the soul tire back and forward. It was a sign of nationalism. It was a symbol of revolution. They, they waved their banners of palm branches, their flags of independence for everyone to see. It's a bit like a scene out of Les Miserables. You know, when the people are lining the streets and they start that song, do you hear the people sing, singing a song of angry men? It is the music of a people who will not be slaves again. When the beating of your heart echoes the beating of the drum, there is a life about to start when tomorrow comes. It's that type of feeling. You know, you feel it on the back of your neck, the hair standing up. You're excited. It's revolution time. This is it. The moment we've been waiting for. He does miracles. He's raised Lazarus from the dead. And now he's going to Jerusalem. Let's make him king. But Jesus has different ideas. They think this is the day. They think this is the hour. Jerusalem, receive your king. The people were intoxicated with the prospect of the coming kingdom. There was euphoria in the crowd as he arrived in Jerusalem. Luke 19 verse 11 tells us, the crowd expected that the kingdom of God was going to appear all at once. They expected a Jewish kingdom where the Roman occupiers would be cast out. Their arrival was about victory. There was not a hint of what was going to really happen. The crowd were ready to take on the world with Jesus as their new ruler. What anticipation. And the anticipation even blocks out the messages that Jesus had been sending to them for weeks, even years. They cannot hear what Jesus is saying to them because anticipation is clouding their mind. I remember my 14th birthday well. I remember it well because that was the year I didn't get the present I had asked for. Now, don't feel bad, Mum. I'm not scarred by it. But I had asked for a CB radio. Do you remember them in the days of Smokey and the Bandit films and Convoy? The CB radio, the truckers would talk to one another and we lived on the edge of the motorway and I wanted a CB radio to talk to the truckers who were going past. And I mentioned the idea to my mum and dad just a few weeks before my birthday. And their reply was, well, that's a nice idea, but we've already got your present. And I thought, that's what I would say if I was a parent, because it builds the anticipation. It builds the surprise. You don't think you're going to get it, but then you are going to get it. Oh, great plan, mum and dad, really well done. And so I was looking forward to getting my CB radio. I was going to mount the aerial on top of the garage, run the cable round and in through my bedroom window. I had it all planned. And every time I talked to them about it, they'd say, but we've already got your present. I put it down to a game they were playing, so I'd get a surprise on my birthday. I had my lines rehearsed. I'd open the box and in wonder I'd say, Oh, I thought you already had my present as I picked up my CB radio in my hands. Well, on the morning of my birthday, I came down the stairs and there was this huge box, absolutely enormous box. I thought to myself, oh, oh, 
they've done it, they've got a big box and inside it will be a smaller box and inside that will be a smaller box and eventually we'll have the box with the CB radio in it. And so I opened up the big box and there it was, an enormous beanbag for my bedroom. They had already bought my present. And I could not accept that truth for the month leading up to it because the anticipation was so high in me. Well, at that point, the truth suddenly dawned. And the same is true of Jesus and his disciples. He had told them over and over again that they were barking up the wrong tree that what they were expecting was never going to happen at this time. But they couldn't hear him for their own sense of anticipation. And there's a real danger that we can fall into that same trap today. We want to hear God say something special to us. We want to believe that he's saying something to us. But in fact, we can be deafened by our own dreams and our own desires. There is a need to listen to God carefully and to discern what he is saying. And critical to that is involving others with us on our listening journey. Walking with trusted and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, because when Jesus speaks, we sometimes have trouble listening, like the crowd who was walking with Jesus towards Jerusalem. Jesus told his disciples exactly what was going to happen. But it was so far removed from their thinking, they couldn't fathom what Jesus was saying. In Luke 18.34, it says, the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them. And they did not know what he was talking about. We must seek to follow God's path for our life which may not be the one that we dreamed of, the one that we thought about. So what does Jesus teach his excited audience that they should expect? Well, he teaches them that you cannot have a crusade without a cross. The people want to see the kingdom of God come now. But Jesus tells them, that the way to the kingdom of God is a journey via a cross. Look at 18 verse 32 says, he will be turned over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. No crusade without a cross. Isaiah 52 and 53 clearly speak, saying that the servant of the Lord must suffer and die. Any messianic hope must include this cross. Jesus is the crucified king, and they just didn't get it. They didn't understand the prophecies. They didn't understand Jesus' own words. And today, people are the very same. Islam wants to have a Jesus as one of its great prophets. Others want Jesus as a great guru. In some parts of the world, he's a a liberation rebel. Within the New Age movement, they'd be quite happy to have Jesus as an example of peace alongside the Dalai Lama. And what Jesus says to the people of his time and to the people of our time is that you cannot have him as king without the cross. You cannot have a movement of people in Jesus' name without the cross of Christ. It's central to any understanding of Jesus. You need to understand him in the context that he came to die. Now, that is a problem because the cross doesn't easily fit into people's thinking then or today. Back then, it was a scandal and a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But Isaiah 53 tells us he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, we are healed. 
that vicarious sacrifice of Christ is a problem for many people today. I'm sure you've heard people saying things like, well, I didn't ask him to die for me. Or I don't think the wrong things that I've done are bad enough that it required someone to die for those sins. Or maybe the most common belief, the good I do outweighs the bad I've done. Why do I need Jesus to die for me? Many people would be happy with a Christianity. In fact, they try to have a Christianity as a way of life without the cross of Christ. But the cross calls us to humble ourselves. The cross calls us to admit our need of a saviour and accept all that he has done for us. The cross calls us to walk with him through sacrifice and humility and surrender before we reach that place of triumph and victory that the crowd so wanted. In other words, the kingdom must first come in people's hearts before it can come in a glorious and triumphant way. In Luke chapter 19 and verses 1 to 10, that's unpacked for them in the story of, the te of Zacchaeus coming to faith. This wee capitalist collaborator and cheat who discovers that Jesus has come to seek and save the lost. Salvation is Christ's first aim. The kingdom of God starts with a change of heart in the individual. It's about moving from death to life through a changed character and a changed lifestyle. Society-wide changes will come because of the kingdom of God, but it will come because of the immediate effects that it has on me and on you. The glorious fulfillment of people following Christ are a changed society and a changed world, but it starts with Christ being crucified and us surrendering ourselves as we walk with him. What the crowd are wanting is going to happen, but first Christ must become the means of salvation for the world. First Christ must die. And if you are someone who hasn't yet believed that for yourself, you can start that journey now. You may have been watching Christians for some time. You may have been tasting and seeing what it means to be a Christian. But the truth is you can only really know what it's about when you allow Christ to turn your life around like he did for Zacchaeus that day. It's good news that Jesus is interested in you, first and foremost. The knock-on effect of that is... The, is hugely significant that the world might also be changed after you have been changed. But primarily God's eye is on you. He loves each and every one of us. He wants to transform each and every one of us. That's where he wants to see the primary breakthrough and the transformation of your life that in turn will one day lead to the transformation of this world. And if you've never got to that place of personal repentance, of confession of your sin and a need for a saviour, it can happen now even on Zoom if you ask Christ to come and become your saviour and Lord. If you confess your sin before him, if you share that confession with someone else and say, I've come to Christ today, you can experience that new life. But maybe before you make that decision, you should make sure you understand and that you hear God's voice of where you're walking and where that walking will take you. Because the final thing I want to talk about this morning is that the kingdom of God is very different from earthly kingdoms. Jesus enters into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. It's surprising. 
His procession looks like the arrival of a great centurion returning from battle, except he's not on his trusted steed. He's not on his battle horse. He's on a little donkey, a little foal, a little colt. Zechariah 9 is being fulfilled as Jesus rides into town. And he's expressing a truth about his kingdom. He's saying gentleness is the nature of my kingship, not warmongering. He doesn't come with chariots and war horses. The nature of his reign is gentleness, a healer, a peacemaker. And his ministry to date has shown that he will uphold the vulnerable. He will look after the oppressed and those who have been placed outside of the city like the lepers. But of course, he then immediately shatters that peaceful illusion. Just as we saw in Oliver's face as he did the Bible reading and that little smirk came on his lips because Jesus arrives in the temple and he's anything but peaceful. He clears the temple. He turns over the tables of the, the money changers. He causes chaos. And we must never think we can put Jesus into some predictable box where we know exactly what he's going to do. It's interesting, the crowd thought he was coming to overthrow the Romans, and instead he overthrows the Jewish leaders, the temple officials, and the priests. And there are times when we discover that the mission of God is not all that we expected it to be or imagined that it might be. We mustn't get caged in by those expectations and anticipations, because sometimes God wants to do so much more than we ask or even imagine. So don't let what's happened in the past in Denny Baptist Church limit your vision for what God can do in the church in the future. Neither should we expect great things without anticipating a battle, a struggle, and maybe even some personal sacrifice. You see, the kingdom of God exists now, but you will have to wait to see its fulfillment. As he taught in the parable of the ten miners in Luke 19, or the ten servants as it's sometimes called, there's a call here to service while we wait for the coming of that kingdom. A call to patience back where we started. A call to perseverance. You'd think that knowing the king would make it easy to wait. But he tells us that there are enemies of the king who are at work. Here in our story, it's the priests, the teachers of the law, and the religious leaders. The point is that waiting for the kingdom of God to come in its fullness requires patience, diligence, hard work in the face of suffering. Those of you who've been reading Acts with us will have seen that over and over again. Anybody who suggests that Christianity is some sort of crutch for the weak to lean on have no understanding of what Jesus is calling us to. Jesus tells us that our life will be tough if we follow him, that it may well require sacrifice ourselves. And so as we journey towards Easter Sunday, Let's, yes, anticipate the cross and its victory. Let's let Jesus into our lives. Let's play our role in building the kingdom of God as people who have been transformed and are being transformed into his likeness at this point in history. Let's reflect that unique character of God's kingdom in the way that we live. But above all, let's not let our ideas of how things should be done color what God wants to do in and through us. He's a God of surprises. Let's be open to being surprised by the Spirit of God as he leads us as a church on a journey towards his enthronement in our lives, in our church, and in our world. 
and may he be glorified as his church seeks to follow his will rather than our own thoughts as those people on the first Palm Sunday. Amen. We're going to sing together the another hymn that cries out, Hosanna, I see the King of glory. And again, let's sing it out as praise to God.
Let's uh, use these words of the prayer together. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.